right, let's let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for waking us up to see another day. We thank you, dear Lord, for your many rich blessings. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank Amen. you especially for your love, Father. Thank you for your love that you demonstrated in, in sending your son into this world to suffer, die, and be uh, raised again for our justification. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together to study your word, Father. Especially we ask that you'll bless us, Father. Bless this effort, dear Lord, to edify your people, Father, and glorify your high and holy name. Mm -hmm. Give us increased capacities for understanding, Father, for wisdom. Help us to be vigilant, Father. Help us always to study to show ourselves approved, Father, uh, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, dear Lord. We pray that you'll bless the uh, teachers this evening. Bless the leadership, Father, for having the vision, Father, to do this. Help us always, Father, to continue to be vigilant in, in doing your will, finding ourselves busy in your service, dear Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Uh, bless us uh, also, Father, those who uh, suffered loss and uh, losses of loved ones, Father. Strengthen those families. Comfort them, dear Lord. Help us to be an encouragement and always in those things that are right and true. We ask that you just be with us, guide us, and protect us, dear Lord. We ask these things in accordance to your will. In Jesus' name we in pray. Amen. Name. Amen. 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 And let me say before Brother Quincy jumps in, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. This is going to be somewhat of a lecture and for you to take notes. It's here for us to take notes and learn. If you have questions, it will be points in time for that. Uh, but if it's something that he says immediately and you want some clarity on it, uh, then we will be monitoring who uh, who raises their hand. And I will be inserting uh, at the appropriate time to make sure that we get the content. All right. Quincy, it's on you, brother. Thank you, preacher, and thank you all for um, being here tonight. Um, I'm sorry, Ricky. Ricky, who's Ricky seven six eight nine? Got a question? Or are you just testing your hand? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saw the hand. I was, I was like, I was, I was like, we just started. We already got it already. <laughs> I, I, I love the hunger in the room. If your question is, is this real? Yes, it's real. So I guess we'll. Move on. All right, do I have a screen sharing capability? Uh, yes, you should. I made you co-host. All right, let's see if I can get here. And it, are my slides advancing you all? Yes. Yes. They're advancing, okay. All right, so yeah, we're going to dive right into it. Uh, as Brother Marcus said, this is going to be Sure, but I am going to uh, go slowly because we have three days to do this. There's a lot that we want to cover. Um, just a little bit about me for those that don't already know me. Um, I'm Quincy Birdsong, and I am. I have the the, the humble honor and privilege of uh, working closely with the education ministry. Uh, it is um, a role that I take very seriously, and it's a role that. Uh, I think aligns with what my secular expertise is in. So I have uh, a doctorate in education, uh, specifically a doctorate in curriculum development. Um, and I'm currently working on a master's in uh, Bible exposition. So this is uh, right in my wheelhouse. And as you will learn in um, Marcus's serve class that uh, we want to make sure that our gifts are aligned with the kingdom um, expects of us, particularly the congregation here at Simpson Street. So I'm honored to do this. And, and looking at the attendees, Brother Marcus, most of the attendees are people that have gone through this before. So this will be a refresher for you. Uh, refresher courses are always good. Uh, I take as many refresher courses as I can because uh, I am not an old man, but I'm older man. And so I forget things. And so I need refreshers often. Uh, and for those of you all that uh, this is brand new to, um, I'm glad that you all are here, and hopefully this will be the first of many times that you get our, interact with what we do in the education ministry. So as we get into this, uh, I want to let you all know what the mission of the education ministry is at Simpson Street. And so our mission is to create Bible-based environment that enhances lifelong learning. And what we mean by lifelong learning, if you've been in the church 
40 years or you've been in the church 40 seconds, it doesn't matter. We're all continuing to learn. Uh, one of the things that we are um, charged to do in the Great Commission, uh, we're charged to make disciples. And so that means we're charged with making learners. And so we want you to be a lifelong learner, no matter how long you've been in the church, uh, no, long, no matter how long I've been in the church, I'm continuing to learn. I learn every uh, Sunday when I listen to Brother Marcus, and I learn every day when I pick up the Bible to study it. Uh, but not only to learn, our mission is to make sure that we effectively apply God's word to our <clears> Christian <throat> journey. Well, the Bible from cover to cover, if we're not able to apply it to our Christian journey. So those are the, that's the twofold mission of the education ministry. And so, um, so there are three spiritual, scriptural applications that we use when we study God's word. And uh, we're going to talk about two of them in this three-day workshop. Uh, and those areas are uh, number one, homiletics. So homiletics is essentially just the art of preaching. And so when uh, Brother Marcus or Brother Benny or Brother Brian or Brother Larry get up into the pulpit or Dr. Harrison gets in the pulpit to preach, it's not just about um, regurgitating knowledge or regurgitating God's word. The art of preaching has to do with how information is organized. And it's also deals with how information is presented in a sermon. So someone could be very knowledgeable of God's word, but that doesn't make them a good preacher. It's a way to organize material in an understandable way, the way to use inflection, raise your voice sometimes, lower your voice sometimes, slow down, speed up. Uh, and then how do you organize everything in a public um, setting? So that's homiletics. I will not be doing any homiletics training because I am not a preacher. I'm a teacher. <laughs> so we'll save the homiletics training for the preachers that we have here at Simpson Street. Um, apologetics is the second application. We do a lot of this, and actually Brother Outler does a lot of this in his teaching in the New Convert class. And apologetics is essentially how do we defend the critics of our faith? So how do we fend, defend Christianity as a whole? And there are a lot of people that um, do not think that Christianity is real. A lot of people don't think God is real. So how do we as members of the body of Christ, how do we as children of God defend our faith, defend what it is that we believe? And Brother Outlet does a great job of teaching some of those strategies in the new convert class. We have to be able to defend what it is, what it is that we believe, because if not, we're not going to be able to be used by God to save souls. And then finally, the scriptural application of hermeneutics, which is what we're going to cover today over the next 40, 45 minutes. Hermeneutics really deals with the theory the theory and methodology of biblical interpretation. And when you think about hermeneutics, how do we take the Bible and interpret it in the way that God intended for it to be given to us? And we're going to talk about some strategies today. Uh, hermeneutics is just a, just a fun way and a uh, very informative way to really get us into the highest level of biblical interpretation. So, What does hermeneutics mean? So it comes from the Greek god Hermes. Hermes was the messenger god. And so Hermes would take a message from one Greek god and give it to another Greek god. But what Hermes had to make sure that he did is he had to make sure that the message that the god, when the, the Greek god was giving him, was actually the message he was delivering to the other Greek god. So what did that mean? Hermes could not add his little spin on it. He couldn't take a message and say, hey, this is what I think uh, this uh, individual meant, and then give the message that he wanted to give. Hermes' job was to take the message from one individual and convey it to the next individual exactly in the way that it was intended to be delivered. Now, that's going to make sense here in a second when we talk about biblical hermeneutics. So these are some of the resources that I'm going to be using. Um, on um, tonight, we're going to use it mostly on tomorrow, Brother Marcus, but tonight we're just going to kind of talk through it. But these are some of the resources we're going to use, and I just want to also show you. Um, so I, I, it's okay to invest. I know we invest money in a lot of different things. This is a, a New Testament, I mean, Old Testament exegesis book. Uh, this is a New Testament Greek book. Uh, this is a 
Hebrew syntax book. Uh, this is a hermeneutics book. So I got a lot of these. I invest a lot of resources into, into books and there are books that are out there. Uh, I assure you that Brother Marcus doesn't only just use the Holy Bible to research his sermons. The Holy Bible obviously is the foundation, but we need other tools that we'll talk about on tonight that really give us a deeper meaning of what is behind the scriptures. So I'm going to need you to participate with me in this first exercise. All right, so I'm going to read this, if you can read this with me. All right. I'm on an airplane and the person I'm sitting next to is having a phone conversation before the plane takes off. And the phone conversation goes like this. Hey, Jack, this is Ed. Make sure you tell the fellas in the back to flip the switch before they lock up. We can settle up at next week's huddle, thanks. Now, I, I never met this person before in my life, but this phone conversation, I'm on the plane, this phone conversation, this is a real phone conversation. This phone conversation is going on right next to me on the plane before we take off. So what information is needed for me to understand what this message meant? And you, you, and you all can chime in. here. We need to know the context. Yeah. All right. Let's be more specific. Let's be more specific. What what is what is more what is the specific information um, I need to know? Kim. Um, who was Ed in the first place? All right. Very good. Very good. All right, Kim. Very good. Who was Ed? All right. What else do we need to know? Cheryl. What switch are they referring to? What? what we don't know anything about this switch. What about this switch? Uh, Sister Johnson. That's what I was about to say, yes. All right, uh, Sister Danielle, what else do we need to know? I was gonna ask who's Ed and who are the fellas? All right, who are the fellas in the back? All right, who else? The back How are you there? gonna settle up with me? Yeah, where, what, uh, the lock. What lock are they locking where? up? Where yeah. are they locking up? What do they need to settle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Keep what going. you need to settle. What's yeah. going to happen if you don't turn off the switch? <laughs> the consequences are not cutting the switch off. Very good. Yeah. Where, where is the back? The back of what? Where is the back? Yeah, fellas in the back. Right. Yeah, that, 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 the back. that sounds very... Back uh, of what? Fellas in the back. What are they yeah. locking up? What are they locking up? What are they locking up? Good, good, y'all. So you, so, so this is, this is very good. So this is how we should study scripture. What we do, I think, sort of erroneously, you all, is we will take a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Asia Minor in AD 72, and we'll act as if Paul is talking directly to us in Atlanta, Georgia in 2024. <laughs> and that's where we mess up. When I look at this message, and you all brought this out. I need to know who Jack is. In order for me to interpret it, I need to know who Jack is. I need to know who Ed is. And not only that, y'all, what else do I need to know? I need to know the relationship between Jack and Ed. That's wow. going to help me understand this message, right? Make, and, I, and then make sure you tell the fellas who are the fellas. Who are the fellas specifically in the back? What is the switch? What is this huddle that he's talking about that's going to happen? next week. What has happened, look at this y'all, what has happened prior to this phone call that is making Jack, before the plane takes off, why does Jack need to call Ed before this plane takes off? Why, why isn't this something that can wait till Jack gets back from his trip? You see, you, you see where I'm going with this? These are all the things that we need to know when we read a passage of scripture. Because if we don't know these very salient details, we will take a message and not know what the message means because we don't know all of these other um, aspects that give us um, for, uh, meaning of what this scripture is saying. 
All right, right good. Thank you. Let me jump in real quick. Yeah, please, please. Uh, Bro, Quincy has has laid out the foundation. He's getting ready to transition over into something that'll that'll make you extremely that'll make you shout. And let me say this: it, it does seem like a lot, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. It almost becomes second nature when you look at a scripture. He's got he he has laid out how to look at just and and through this exercise. But when it comes to scripture, you do the exact same thing. And you may say, oh, that's a lot. Well, the devil wants you to give up on it because <laughs> he wants you to say, oh, this is too much for just one scripture. But how are you truly going to know what the Bible is trying to teach you and share with you if you're not willing to put the work in? And so every week, Quincy or somebody will text me and say, oh, you know, uh, what the relationship, like when you understand the relationship between Paul and Timothy, then you understand how Paul can tell Timothy, son, you need to stir up your fire because I've been with you for a long time. Not everybody can talk to Timothy like that and he listens. So so this is, and when I say this is a lot, it's not too much, but if you've never done this before, it seems like a lot, but I'm just encouraging you to stick with it because the more you do it, the more the spirit will pour into you. Thank you, thank you, preacher. That 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 is that is so important. And then, and j- just to add to that, after you do it so long, it actually becomes fun, uh, brother Mar. When when you re- when you realize these relationships, you're like, wow. You know, when you realize that Timothy was a, was the preacher at Ephesus when Paul was talking to Timothy. You know, you know these these are the kinds of things, and you you get excited, and and just these light bulbs go off. And I think that that is. That I think is what inspired our education ministry the most. It's not that you know, it's not that we love teaching so much, but we love to see, to see people learn more than we love to hear our, our own voice. And I think that is what's been a- enabled us to be successful. So these are the six steps that we're going to to cover. Some of these steps are, I'm going to take a little bit more time on them than others because they are a lot more involved. Um, but these are the six steps we're going to talk about over the next um, 30 minutes and then tomorrow um, and then next week and then the following week. And the, those six steps, uh, Sister Sheila, did you have a comment? Yeah, when I read that, uh, Brother Q, he said, flip the switch. I'm like, well, what if it's more than one switch back there? <laughs> he, he didn't say a specific switch. So that lets me know it could be more than one switch. And that's why the, the, this next exercise we're going to do is going to kind of help us do that sort of drill because you can't just stop at what you see on the surface. And that is what we that, that's why we're really blessed to have Brother Marcus be both a preacher and a teacher because he gives us and challenges us to drill down. So here are the six steps. First step, we need to know the historical, cultural and contextual analysis of the scripture. Um, so we need to know historically, where does the scripture fall? Culturally, where does it fall? And then what is the context? And we're going to talk about vertical context, horizontal context. We'll get all of that in a second. Lexical syntactical analysis is the second step. What do the words mean? Bible is, we read the Bible in English because that's the language that we speak. We're going to talk a little bit about the original language that the Bible was written in and how that's going to help us uh, know more about it. And then what are the relationships between the words? What's the grammar? You know, what's the tense? What's the voice? What's the mood? Then the theological analysis, right? So we're going to talk about, you know, what, how is God speaking to his people in this particular passage? And what had to do with how we interpret the scripture? Also, genre identification and analysis is the fourth step. There are different genres in the Bible. Everything that's written in the Bible is not uh, to be read as prose. You're not reading a book. Um, in the sense that there's one singular literary form throughout. There's actually different literary forms from Genesis to Revelations, and that's going to help us understand the meaning as well. We're going to compare with our other interpretations. Right now, you all have some sort of Bible, I hope, that you bring to church every Sunday. Um, I am a purist, and I do not uh, read Bible verses on my phone because I don't know it. I just it just feels weird for me to read on the phone. I gotta have pages that I'm literally turning, but that's that's just me. I'm not I'm not, I'm not judging anybody that uses reads the Bible on their phone. But what kind of Bible do we have? Do we have a Bible that's in the King James? Do we have a Bible that's the Message? Do we have a Bible that's the 
you know, new, uh, new international version. And what difference does it make? What type of Bible we use? We'll talk about that. And then lastly, it's the application. That's when the rubber meets the road. We've done the interpretation of how do we apply that to us. All right. So the slide that you see right now should be step one. Does everybody see that slide? Mm -hmm. All right. So step one, we need to know who the author is. So when we read any passage of scripture, first thing we need to think about is who is the author? Mm -hmm. And who is the audience? Okay, so often the audience. Other things around this, not only the author and the audience, but the relationship between the author and the audience is very, very important. Um, when was it written? What are the cultures of the author and the audience? Do we have a Jewish author writing to a Jewish audience? Or do we have a Jewish author writing to a non-Jewish author? Do we have a non-Jewish author writing to a Jewish audience? So these are, these are the kind of things. How does this compare to other writings by this author? This is particularly important in the New Testament because um, the Apostle Paul um, has written many things in the New Testament. <clears throat> and so we, um, in this analysis, we compare Paul's letter to uh, Timothy is what? Is Paul writing to his son in the gospel, a preacher, okay? Paul writing to a preacher. However, when we see the book of Ephesians, it's what? Is Paul writing to what? A congregation. Completely different interaction, right? Apostle writing to a congregation, and then Paul, Paul writing to a personal mentee, a personal protege, his son in the gospel. So knowing the difference between um, one individual, just because one individual is writing the same letter doesn't mean that the letter has the same purpose. And then how does it compare to other authors addressing the same group? We see this in the Gospels. We see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all writing a summary of the same thing, but their audience is different. So how do these four Gospels compare to each other? Some tools that we use, and we'll go to these tools here in a little bit. Insight.org uh, is a website that I use often. Insight.org is a website that tells you all these things we're asking. It tells you the author, tells you the audience, tells you when it was written, the cultures, tells you all these things. So insight.org. And then also the blue letter Bible.org, which is um, another tool that we're going to uh, go later on this evening. Any so questions about that first? Question, that was my question is these questions that we ask, and I'm certain that asking this as a student we find you find those things in insight.org or blue letter bible i just want everybody to know you're not left to figure it out on your own there are tools right. where you find that um to to make it more palatable and what what, what we're going to do either later on tonight or um, or next week brother marcus we're going to we're going to spend most of our time on those sites and I'm going to talk you through how you navigate them. Yeah, of course. Uh, because these are week, but it's tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow? What, what, what am I? What am I doing? I'm, I'm all thinking about Wednesday night. Tomorrow. Yeah, all right. Not next tomorrow. Week. All right. All right. Tomorrow, we're going to actually go through these websites, and we're going to we're going to navigate them. All right. So let's do our our next exercise. And so this is an ex or exercise in uh, not only what words mean, but culture. So common verse, I used to hear this verse a lot when I was young. I used to hear uh, preachers use this, I used to hear elders use this. And so I wanna see if you all know what this verse means. All right, Proverbs 22, verse 28. Uh, just, just, a, just, just a quick, who, who's the author of Proverbs? Real quick. <laughs> Author of Proverbs. Proverbs. David. Or Solomon. 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 Very good. Solomon. Solomon. And a, and a proverb is a wise saying. And Proverbs was written by King Solomon. King Solomon has been attributed to being uh, the wisest king that ever lived. So Proverbs, the author is, is Solomon. And he wrote, uh, he wrote Proverbs as a list of wise sayings. Uh, it fits the genre of poetry, 
meaning he, he did not write these wise sayings as law. He wrote these wise sayings as things that people could tap into um, that could give them encouragement and could give them inspiration uh, as they read through these wise sayings. So this wise saying is remove not the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. This is coming from the Revised Standard Version. Remove not the ancient landmark. So what is, what is Solomon telling us to do? Um, first one, do not make changes from the way that we've always done things. The next choice is, it's saying do not steal. Uh, the next choice is, do not remove the guideposts that direct travelers. Next one is, it doesn't mean any of these. <laughs> and the last one is, it means, it, it means all of these. All right, so what's the answer? None of them. All right, we got, well, we got, we got, somebody says none of them? Yes. I say who thinks it's the, one. Who thinks it's the I, first response? Do not make changes from the ways that we used to do things. That was Sister Coles. When okay, I said so we have, above. okay, Sister Coles says none of the above. Okay, we have some people that think it means don't make changes. Who thinks it means do not steal? Okay, nobody really thinks oh. that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got a couple of people that think it means do not steal. All right, the third one says do not remove the guideposts that direct travel. Does anybody think it means that? All right, so here is where knowing what words means tells us. All right, the word landmark means uh, it is a border. It is a border um, defines territory. So when Solomon says, do not remove the landmark, he's saying, don't remove the thing that designates territory. So if I live next door to Brother Marcus, a landmark would be that thing that says which property is Marcus's and which property. Sorry, Quincy, I just muted everybody. So just unmute yourself and continue on. But everybody, please stay muted so that we don't get your feedback from the back but unmute yourself when you're getting, only when you're getting ready to talk. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Q, unmute I'm, yourself. I, okay, okay, I guess I need to unmute. Okay, yeah, so the landmark is saying whose territory is which. So actually the answer to this is the second response. It's saying do not steal, because if I move the thing that separates my property from Marcus's, then I might do what? I might scoot it more toward Marcus's part, property. And then I'm actually stealing some of his <clears throat> property. Mm. Okay. So you see what's going on there? If you read that and say, remove the ancient landmark, it means don't make changes, which is how it was taught to me when I was a little kid. <laughs> it's because we have to know what the word landmark means in order for this verse to make sense. Everybody get that? Brother Quincy, and if I could, man, I, and I definitely appreciate that and, and how you're, you're just breaking that down, because again, I too, you know, just growing up, you know what I'm saying, you hear preachers preach, remove not the ancient landmark, and immediately they go back, we can't change nothing, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, using, and using this as their proof text, and when you study it, and truly study it, and study the words, it means none of that, because they take it out of context. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're going to make sure that we are equipped with biblical interpretation tools that we know what things actually mean, as opposed to what a man uh, was trying to make it mean. All right. Next exercise. Um, this is Mark 14 verses 13 through 14. The author here is Mark. Mark is a fellow laborer of um, of, uh, of Paul and he's Barnabas's cousin. So we know a little bit about, about, about Mark. Mark was the author of one of the gospels and um, he's writing here, he says, and he sent forth two of his disciples and said unto them, go ye into the city and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water, follow him. And whosoever he shall go in, Say ye to the good man of the house. The master says, 
where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? So this is Jesus looking for the place where uh, he's going to eat um, Passover with his disciples. So if you look at this, let's talk about the culture here. Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Now, someone mentioned this earlier when they were talking about the Sister Sheila, when we were talking about the plane. Um, meet a man with a pitcher of water? I mean, there could be, there could be dozens of men can't bearing a pitcher of water, right? So how are they going to know who to follow? Anybody? Anybody want to give a guess? Don't be scared. I guess. I, I would think that given that they are disciples at this point in time and learning Christ, that um, he would have, they would know him well enough to know that it's not going to be a stranger stranger, but someone who has a pitcher of water that looks like they may be the right person. I don't know okay. how I'm saying. You know, Anybody else? A little yeah, insight. No, no Good, good. Anybody else want to garner a guess? We're talking about yes. history and culture and context. Yeah, I think so. Sister Johnson? I would say a person holding a pitcher of water that is actually actively looking for someone, looking out for someone. All right, another good try. Anybody else want to try? Marina? That's what I was going to say. Um, I would think because of the culture, this is Passover. They are familiar with preparation for Passover. Very good. Passover is one of the one of the uh, Jewish feasts that they celebrated annually. Anybody else want to try? Is it normal for the man to be carrying the pitcher, or would women be out there carrying the pitcher of water? Bingo. That's where it helps them know the culture. The reason why this is who said um, that? Carol I don't Bragg. know who said that. Oh, Carol. she's Before, in, sister. Oh, she's in my class. Oh, what is this? Yeah, I'm just wondering. Yeah, sister, <laughs> <laughs> sister Braggs, our resident Bible scholar. Yeah, that, that is that is how that is how that's why this is distinctive, and that's how it's important to know the culture. A man wouldn't be carrying a picture. Only women did that. Mm. That's where it helps to know the culture. So when they say go to the city and you're going to meet a man bearing a pitcher of water, what? That man is going to be standing out because men are not going to be carrying pitchers of water. Hmm. So when you see a man carrying a pitcher of water, like, ah, that's, that's how you're going to know where the disciples are. And that's where you're going to know where to go and, and have the Passover feast. So very, very good. That's why, why culture is so important. Not only knowing the means of the words, but knowing what the culture is. And so you, all, you, hear, you hear Marcus talk about a lot in the pulpit. When he talks about the setting, he'll say, oh, no, they'll say something like, you know, David is speaking wartime language, right? Because they're making they're in preparation for war or uh, this environment here. This is like a, a courtroom setting. Right. And so these cultural things provide us a lot of more additional information about what's going on. Uh, Trina, did you have another point or were you um, you just didn't put your hand? There? Oh, no, I didn't have another point. OK. <laughs> All right, so very good. You've done you've done great so far. Y'all are great students. I, that's why I love teaching to y'all because y'all are such good students. All right. Now, so that's the first one: his, historical and cultural context, author, culture, context. Second step: What do the words mean? And what is the relationship the words have with each other? So that's the second thing that we do after we look at the context, the history, what's going on. Then the, th the next thing we do is we try to figure out what the words mean. Now, who can tell me what language the New Testament was written in? Hebrew. Greek. Co Kohen Greek. Yeah. New Testament, Greek. How about the Old Testament? He, uh... Somebody Greek. said it. Hebrew. 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 Yeah, so we got Hebrew, Old Testament, we got Greek, New Testament, and the Bible we read every um, time we study is in English. So there is, um, there may be an issue there, right? Because 
you know, just as a person in healthcare, we oftentimes translate our forms into Spanish because we have uh, we have Hispanic patients in our hospital. But you know what happens? Sometimes what? Things get lost in translation. Mm -hmm. Because the document was originally written in English. And now I'm trying to put it in Spanish, Brother Aller. Sometimes it doesn't go word for word like I want it to. Same way with the Bible. So we have to understand that these, these words were not originally written in English. So we have to figure out what, how we don't lose things in translation. And I'm going to give you an example of how a Hebrew idiom can mean something completely different when we try to translate it into English. And then what is the relationship between the words? Um, my late father was an English professor. And so the um, relationship between words is very important um, when we talk about English grammar. And so you, you all may be familiar with Schoolhouse Rock. I grew up on Schoolhouse Rock and there were all these little, uh, these little cartoons. So it was like noun. Well, what's, what's a noun? Noun is a person, place, or thing. Verb is an action. And an adverb is, you know, so these, we still got to know those types of grammatical principles, even when we study the Bible. We can't study the Bible and present something that's in present tense when it's actually in past tense or it's actually in future tense. We have to know these relationships. All right, so let's let's give look at some look at a really easy example. And uh, brother Foy Lee, this is a, what when I had that stay with you and Sister Marion, we talked about the word hell, right? Remember we had that 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 study about the word hell. So we're going to use we're, are we going to use that for this class tonight? <laughs> so the word hell, the word hell in English is yes is just hell, right? Hell, we know what hell is. Hell is you know where is is a destinations, right, that our soul can spend eternity, right? Our soul can spend eternity in hell or our soul can spend eternity in heaven. Our soul is the only thing that has an eternal destination, right? Our, our body, our flesh does what? Goes back to the, to the earth because we were created from the earth. Then the spirit goes back what? To God. Remember, God gave us the spirit um, um, Genesis, where it says God breathed into man the breath of life, where God gave us a little bit of him, and put it in us. That spirit goes back to God because God gave it to us in the first place. Body goes back to the earth, but our soul spends eternity somewhere. So the Bible talks about, in the English language, uses hell to mean several different things. So Matthew 16, 18, it says, and I shall uh, also unto thee, thou, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell prevail against it. Second Peter 2 verse 4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. The word hell again. Third use of the word hell. Mark 5, Matthew 5, 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. Hell, three times. English, we would say what? Hell. It's hell, 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 hell. All mean the same thing. But when we do a deeper dive, what we're going to see is the first hell is Hades. And Hades is the place where all departed souls are. Hades, where all departed souls go. Now, since this is where all departed uh, souls go. Brother right, Poison, I'm sorry. Hades, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think it's important when you say all to also include Jesus. The Bible says mm -hmm. that Jesus yep. went to hell. Okay. So, so, so I think that's going to bring it out because we think of Jesus. We never think of Jesus going to hell. But mm. the Bible says he went to hell. So now, as you explain it, what you're getting ready to do, do an excellent job. But I just wanted to put Jesus in there so that yeah, we yeah. really can see the Bible does does not ever contradict itself. Jesus yeah. went to hell. That's right. That's right. And so, so that first hell, Brother Marx was, was talking about, is is Hades. That's where all departed souls. Are. So Hades is where departed souls, even the good departed souls, 
all the parcels were to Hades. Now, let me, I'm, I'm going to break that down a little bit further in a second. But it says, but look at what it says doesn't prevail against it. It doesn't say that hell shall not prevail against it. It says what? It says the gates. So you can't miss any of the words because if you miss any of those words, then the whole meaning of the scripture is different. It's not saying that hell shall not prevail. It's at the gates. So basically it's saying that the, 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 the constraints of where your souls, the part of souls go, are not going to prevail against what the church is going to be able to accomplish. Is everybody, everybody with me? Now, Hades, all the part of souls. Now, Second Peter, it says... God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell. That hell is the Greek word tataru. Tataru, stay with me, <laughs> is the portion of Hades, what, what, where the bad souls are. Is everybody with me? Hades, all the part souls. Tataru is the part of Hades where the bad souls are. All right. Now, so we have we have Hades, hell in Matthew 16, 18, Tataru, hell in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. Same word in English. Greek, two completely different words. Now we're going to have a third word. <laughs> Matthew 5, 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it's profitable. Now look, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Hell. This hell is Gehenna. Gehenna is the hell hell. That's like the, I used to hear the old preacher say the show enough hell, which is whatever he meant by that. But this is the permanent destination for a, for a soul that is going to have eternal torment. All right. So just a really quick example of how one word in English could be the same word, but in the Greek, it can mean three completely different things. All right, everybody, everybody see that that graphic? Can you, All right. can you I have a question. Yeah. Quincy, Go I ahead. have a question. Is the, yeah, the, sure. the first hell Hades, is that paradise? Oh, very good. Who said that? Carol. <laughs> it is. It is. Tatar, Tataru in 2 Peter verse 4 is the what? Is the bad part of Hades. And Sister Bragg's talking about paradise. Paradise is what? Where the good souls go in Hades. Very good. Sister Bragg, I can, Brother Marcus, you're doing a good job in your class. Hey, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, we said Hades, all the departed souls. Tataru is where the bad souls go. Paradise is where the good souls go. You remember when Jesus talked to the criminal? He said, to, but you know, today I was in paradise, right? Also, another word for that, Abraham's bosom. Remember the rich man in Lazarus? They said he looked up and saw um, he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Also talking about paradise. Very good. Very good. All right. Cheryl. This is just an observation, Brother Quincy, because yeah. in breaking down the hell like you, you just did, it really lets us know that it's so imperative to study because I was thinking the same thing about the lat. I knew the latter one, but I wasn't sure about the paradise. I thought about it, but I wasn't sure. But and I knew the latter one, and mm -hmm. it just helps us to know how important it is to really use the tools like the Blue Letter Bible, you know, to break these things down. And my appreciation has been from getting to understand and utilize the the Blue Letter Bible. How um, my um, Bible growth has has you know has just intensified because I know when I don't know something I'll go write the blue letter and I'll figure it out and so this is a perfect example not to just take something for face value. Absolutely, and so what I want you to do before we go to this next exercise, um, it, 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 all of you that have a smartphone, uh, I want you to download the Blue Letter Bible app to your phone, and the Blue Letter Bible app is just BLB. So Quincy's uh so, so yeah. this, and I think you answered it, says what is the difference between the hell that bad souls go to and the hell where there is eternal torment? Uh and and some of it, and I'll I'll answer a piece of it in Yeah, please. Yeah. So so 
all souls, whether you're in paradise or Tatara, all souls are waiting for the final judgment. They have not been judged yet, but they're waiting in torment or they're waiting in the bosom of Abraham. Okay? Right. But the final judgment has not come yet where God will dispense sentence of come on, you know, uh, you've been found faithful over a few things. I will now make you rule over many things, enter into the paradise or depart from me, ye work of iniquity. I never knew you. Damn. So, so, so that is the final judgment, which no one has gotten to yet. But and it may be oversimplified and Alabama oh, perfect. Simplified, but it's it's like you're waiting and you're in a waiting room. <laughs> you, you, you you're in a waiting room waiting for the doctor to call you in or you're in a courtroom mm -hmm. waiting for the judge to call you up to the stand to 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 give your sentence, whether it's paradise, which is what is heaven or whether it's eternal hell. So no, nobody has been judged yet. That day is going to come when the world comes to an end because we're living in the last days. So, so that's, that's you know, yeah. Well, that's, I, can't, I can't add anything to it. And it's, you know, First Thessalonians 4, right? Talks about that. It's, you know, you're, they're going to be, uh, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be us that are still living, right? And then there's going to be the, the souls, they're going to be the people that have already died. And then the Bible says, what? We're all going to be what? Call up in the air together. Mm -hmm. All right, call up in the air. Now that's going to be, that's going to be every, that's going to be every soul going to be called up in the air together. Like Brother Marcus said, the people that have already died, they're waiting. They're in a, they're in, they're in a waiting room right now. And they're not in their final destination yet. That happens after the judgment, according, according to Revelations, right? And then that's when Satan and hell um, and death are all, they spend, uh, that's where the in, eternal torment begins. So, yes, yeah, th thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, Gloria, well, had I did, yeah, I had a question. The um, so when when they refer to the Hadean world, does that encompass? What does it encompass when when they talk about the Hadean world? Hadean Hadean world is the is the departed souls. That's so Hadean everybody. world includes yeah, that's everybody. That's, so that's, to that's every. So it's all of them. That's the all Indian world. Everything. Okay. And it's and it's and it's, comp and it's comprised of Tataru and um, right. and paradise. Paradise. Mm -hmm. okay. And and if you read the story of Rich Man and Lazarus, it talks right. about remember it talks about that gulf mm -hmm. that was fixed between them that right. separates um, the Tataru from paradise. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there's a gulf that's fixed between them. So you got all of that is Hades, right? Right, but then there's so a gulf. The there's that gulf that's right there that had that separates uh, the bad souls from the good souls. So it's the good souls and bad souls. They're not like they're not like hanging out together in Hades, right? They're, since there's are they're already separated, even in the the, the Hades. So Ryan, where's that scripture? That is in Luke chapter two, verse sixteen, beginning at verse number nineteen, sir. So y'all write that down and look at that. It will give you a greater and a better understanding of how hell is. And it will also give you comfort when people die in the Lord, you know, that they're not being tormented. Uh, that's right. So, you know, that that's just my little take on it. So, uh, there, and and in that same verse, in that same verse, you're gonna see a reference, that, that just to add to that, you're gonna see a reference to Abraham's bosom uh -huh. in Luke 16. Abraham's bosom, is synonymous with paradise that Jesus mentions on the cross. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Was, that, Luke, was that Luke 16, 19? Through 33. Yes. Uh -huh. Luke 16, 19 through 33. It's in and, the chat. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to uh, tie it in, Sheila. But but if, if the, the, the last point I want to make about the difference, they're, they're all in the same area, but there's a great gulf. And the reason you know that one is paradise and one is torment, the, the rich man uh, of Lazarus, the rich man said, can I just go, to, listen, mm -hmm. can, I, can I go back and warn my family members <laughs> that this is not even a place you want to come to? So yeah. that lets me know as you study, and I've been studying a lot about death, people who are dead are conscious. They are very much aware of what's going on 
up here. They just can't do anything about it because, mm -hmm. it, well, if they're not going to believe the preachers that's preaching every Sunday, why would they believe somebody from the dead? Mm -hmm. so, so if you read that, you'll get a very yeah. good understanding of what happens when you die. So, mm -hmm. um, so Tanya, yeah, I love that. You you took it from me. You took it. That's well, where I it it it's worth saying twice. It's worth saying yeah. twice. I, I was gonna say the rich man said, "Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, because I'm tormented in the flames." So basically, when you die, you know where you're headed, and there's nothing you can do at that point. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. And she, Sheila, the last last comment. That was what I was thinking too, uh, Tanya. Like we, they are aware, and like you're in these this certain area in these holding spaces, you know, yep. in hell. But you are aware of what's going on. You, those who are being tormented, they see what's going on. That's right. And, and so uh, okay, and and so let me let me just add this. We're gonna go to John twenty one. Um, <laughs> not only does a rich man know he's being tormented. I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a different spin on it. Lazarus knows he's in eternal bliss. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I know I know when we tell that story. We're like, oh man, you know, you know, the rich man knew he was in torment, but we 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 leave out the part that Lazarus also knew that he was in mm -hmm. uh, in glory, right? And that's that's where we're that's if we're if we go the path of Lazarus, then we don't have to worry about the torment. Yeah, right. So we got it. It's a, this, that's just a different way to, to live. Uh, so Lula has her hand raised. Okay. Up. In your queue. Okay. Lula? You don't mute. I, no, she's not, but I can't hear. She talking. All right. Well, we'll come back to Lula. All right. I'll back to you. Just, I mean, just keep trying, Lula. Go ahead, Q. Yeah. Okay. So we got, um. so how much, how much time we have been? I'm just trying to make sure I come to a good spot. Uh, we have about seven to 10 minutes. Okay, great. We'll just we'll just keep going in until you tell me to stop. So okay. now we're we're still talking about we're still talking about the lexical and syntactical analysis, right? What do words mean and what's the relationship between them? Now let's look at this one, John 21, verse 15. So Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, This is Peter, saying, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said back to Peter, then feed my lambs. So you got love and love. What does the word love mean? You hear this word love talked about all the time um, from Brother Marcus. Agape. Yeah, so agape, agape is the noun, which talks about the unconditional love that God has for us. And so then when you move, when you when you uh, put it in the verb form, it still looks the same as, as agapeo, mm -hmm. which is the verb form of agape, but it's that it, but you understand what it means. Now, so the first love, Jesus is asking Peter, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? That is a, that is the agapeo, the unconditional. But then Peter responds. He says, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. That love is what? Philia. Philia. Yeah. Okay. Right? So we got Jesus is asking Simon, do you love, do you, are you able to love unconditionally, no strings attached? <laughs> but Peter responds like, yeah, I love in a familiar way. Right? So there's two different, two different loves that we're talking about. So clearly, when you read this in the English, it makes it look like they're on the same page, right? But in actuality, they're not. That actually, there's a disconnect here. Jesus is asking, does Peter, is Peter able to demonstrate a certain kind of love? Peter's response is, I'm able to demonstrate this level of love. So when you go that, a deeper dive, you go behind this verse, you see that there is a disconnect. Now, by the time you get to the end of this exchange, mm -hmm. what? They're both on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Oh, my God. Yeah. That, and, that, and that's where that's where, that's where where your eyes just light up. Like, wow, they're, they're disconnected. And then it does again. Disconnect. And then, bam, ah, now what? They're back on the same page. And that and that is why when, when Marcus preaches, oh, man, I, I'm trying not to get excited here. That's when Marcus preaches from Peter. 
You know what I do? I think about this exchange. Mm-hmm. Okay, y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. We, we got to learn how to study the Bible in context to really get the power. When I think about Peter talking about the devil coming after him and the adversary and talking about casting, talking about casting and talking about humbling. When I hear Peter talking about being the example, when I hear Peter talking about this, what do I do? I go back to this exchange. Peter comes from a place where there, he had disconnect with Jesus and now they're in perfect harmony. And now when Peter writes this letter, it now comes from a perspective of harmony when it used to be a, a, a posture of disconnect. Mm-hmm. So whenever I see, whenever I hear Marcus preach from Peter, I think about those exchanges that Peter and Jesus had. It's not just about, oh, Peter is talking to, talking to me sitting in, in the pews of Central Street. No, that's not about that at all. Peter has a journey himself as the author of that epistle. All right, I'll, I'll calm down. All right, so uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, Quincy. Your brother Q. Yes. Quincy. And I'll end here. Go ahead. Um, Hello. It's okay if I go first, Leslie, since I have my hand up. Sure, I'll be able to go. Okay. So what I love about these this mm-hmm. verse, and not just stopping at um, 15, but taking it all the way to the end, like you were saying, is that there was a misunderstanding of, like you said, the, the death of love or what love is being referred to. And so Jesus gives him that, that avenue to ask him again, so that see if he is on the same page, to see if he does understand. And I think that's the beauty that we have with, with Christ is that he lays it out there for us so that if we don't understand something, it is so many different you know, scriptures that will guide us to the right path and, and the, the right understanding of what he really wants for us in our lives. And that is so important. And that's that's and thank you, Cheryl, because that also feeds the context, right? Absolutely. Jesus, Jesus asked Peter three times. What, 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 is that, what does that make you think of? What else happened three times as it relates to Peter? Deny. Denial. He denied. Ah. You see, you see how the you see the continuity of scripture? You gotta study with the continuity. Because if you don't, if you look at the exegesis of a scripture individually and you're not um, aligning it with other scriptures that surround it, when you're not aligning it with the characters, the scriptures mean something that is not designed for it to mean. All right. So, Leslie. Uh, Leslie, and this this, this will be the last thing I'll be able to. Okay. I I was thinking uh, about how Peter must have felt in, Mm. in dying. Jesus, and he was probably say, if I tell him that I love him, he's not going to believe me, you know. Yeah. And and I and I could see why he came back with, yeah, Jesus, I I I, I like you, you know. I <laughs> we all right, you know, we good. But yeah, he, but he kept on. He he gave him. Uh, he said it again. He and then he said it again. Uh, uh, what was what is the love? It's unconditional. Um, a God God mm-hmm. Yeah, he, at three times he said, it. and then, but but that last one, that correct me if I'm wrong. That last time Jesus said to Peter, "Okay, Peter, do you like me?" I, he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I like you." <laughs> he said, "What do you see?" The last one, they were finally what sent using the same look. Yeah, they were using the, right, same the first word. two. They were using different. They were using different words for love. The, the last one is the one, and, and it's and that's a great point, Leslie, because Jesus was saying, "Okay, look, I, I need you to do some stuff, but I need us to be on the same page for you to be able to carry it out." And that's why he kept. That's why he kept asking him. Finally, they said, "Oh, finally, they met sort of in the middle, or they came on the same page." Like, okay, this is where we go. But at the end of the day, Jesus needed Peter to do what? Feed, feed the sheep. Mm-hmm. And we see that in we see that in Acts chapter two. That was what he ended up doing and, and being the, the deliverer of the first gospel sermon. So this slide we're going to end with, and this is where we're going to pick up on tomorrow. We'll talk about the third step, the theological analysis. I'm going to go through this slide and then we're going to end for tonight. 
And so you have to come back tomorrow because then you 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 will not know what to do after if you don't come back tomorrow. So you got to come back tomorrow. So we need to know the we need to know the theological analysis. What is the level of theological understanding at the time of the scripture being written? And does this impact the meaning of the text to the original audience? So we have to know what the author understood and what the <coughs> author was when they wrote it, but also where what? Where the audience was when they wrote it. We need to know where they were from a theological perspective in order for us to understand the scripture. At, at the time of the writing, what was the relationship between the author and God? What I just brought up with Peter, right? When Peter wrote his epistle, he was at a different place than when Peter's rules referred to in the Gospels, right? So theological analysis of where the author was. What was the relationship between the audience and God? What did the audience understand when this letter was written, when this book was written? We're going to talk about Nick tomorrow, continuity versus discontinuity. And, and what I want you to think about between now and tomorrow, is the Bible continuous or is the Bible discontinuous? What do I mean by that? Is the Bible a continuous thread from Genesis to Revelation and all of it is connected? Or is the Bible Genesis to Malachi, hard stop, Matthew to Revelation, two completely discrete um, messages to us? So I want you to think about that tonight. Is it continuous or discontinuous? Gospel versus law. What's the, what's the difference between something in scripture that's designed to be gospel, grace, love, and salvation, the good part, or which part of what we're reading is about the law, talking about God's hatred of sin, his wrath, his judgment? Both of them are important on our Christian journey. We have to know the gospel and the law. We can't pick one or the other because just as much as God is faithful to love us and to, and to uh, give us grace, he's just as faithful to punish us if we do wrong. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the three major dispensations. Patriarch, Mosaic, and Christian. The dispensation of a scripture that we read also lets us know um, the, the deeper meaning because dispensation means how does God interact with his people? And when we're reading a scripture, what is God's way of interacting with his people when this scripture was written? Because that's going to determine the meaning as well. So come back tomorrow, same bad time, same bad channel. We're going to pick this up. Uh, you don't want to miss it. It's going to get, as my grandmother would say, it's going to get gooder and gooder as we as we go through these next couple of days. So, Brother Marcus. All right. Thank you, Q. First of all, um, we kind of want to know if everybody enjoyed this, if it was interesting to you uh, to at least hold you for 45 minutes or so, um, because this is something uh, that we want to do. And uh, we're getting ready to go in just a few moments. I'm going to ask Brian to um give us a dismissal prayer and i think he had something and we skipped over him so he can have the last word and dismissal prayer we also want to we had a great number tonight uh and we don't want to overlook anybody I, I understand that not everybody on here is probably from atlanta or simpson street uh if not just put in who you are where you're from uh we just want to recognize you and thank you so much uh, we take great pride in Bible study and teaching people how to study the Bible. Uh, I got several texts. I, I want you to study the the, the rich man and Lazarus uh, text. It, it's one of the ones that uh, is, is sometimes misunderstood because the question yeah. becomes, if I die and I'm in paradise or I'm in Tatarth, then why is God going to judge me? Because I already know where I'm going. So why does there need to be a judgment? First of all, when when God judges and, and what so I tell people this, what happens after people die? That, that's that's God's business. <laughs> yeah, that's God's business, because you get you get into talk about, oh, I know he went to heaven. I know he went to hell and she went to hell and this. Person. So what we need to do is teach what the Bible says, because God is the judge. God is the judge. We have to be careful who we think went to hell. Now, there are some people going to hell. I know that people who reject Jesus Christ and say, I won't know more of him, but I know they're going to hell. So, But I, I don't get into sending people to hell. So, And so here, here's the final thing. Regardless of if you're in paradise or Tatar, when God judges you, it's not going to compare. In other words, even if you're in paradise, it's not going to compare to heaven. Okay, heaven is going to be so much more than that. If you're in Tatara, 
hell ain't even gonna compare because it's gonna be so much, so much more devastating than that. So what we do, we preach to the living to get your spiritual house in order because death is coming. Okay. So, but it's such an interesting story that will give you great comfort. Um, and knowing that if you die in the Lord, everything's gonna be all right. So, so so that's where we are. And, and it's a great debate. People say, well, if I already know, then then people get into predestination. And, and you know, if God already know where I'm going, then why can't I just live the way I want to live if God is already determined where I'm going? Well, first of all, that's not wise. Uh, so, so, so that, that, there's a lot of other things I'm not getting into, but, but thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. And I hope we have just as many back on tomorrow night because it will be just as interesting. And if there's something that we're missing or something, keep in mind, I, I just thought about this while preaching. So, so, so this is, this is, I, I thank Quincy for, uh, jumping on this and 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 being being that person, and I thank you for for just changing your schedule and being here on tonight. And we won't keep you any longer. And so we thank you so much. We love you, um, uh, each and every one of you. And we hope, trust, and pray that you understand that the first piece of fuel for your faith fire is the Word of God. If you don't get this, your fire will burn low. So, Brian, you have the final word. And uh, Ben, I don't know if there's any housekeeping items we need to take care of, but Brian, Brian will have the final word and lead us in a word of prayer if Benny does not have anything or if Benny does have something, uh, we can go after him. No, nope, we're good. Um, you got, all right. You got to be. All right. So I, I was just going to say I got a couple of text messages about the rich man and Lazarus and around the same sentiments about if I go to hell and I already know my fate, then what's the purpose of judgment? And I remember uh, Brother Butler shared with me uh, that if you go to jail and you know you're guilty, you still got to go before the judge to receive your sentence. And just because you're guilty does not change that the fact that you need uh, sentencing. So the same thing with where we end up in that state of uh, hate, the hate in world, whether you're in Tataru or uh, paradise, you still have to go before the judgment seat of God. So I think this is a great lesson on tonight, Quincy, always, as always masterful. Uh, and we're just thankful for the great number that has showed up on tonight. Let us bow and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this hour. Oh, Father God, where your minister of education here at the Census Street Church of Christ has richly shared important to us, oh, Father God, these tools and this knowledge to make us better vessels to study, to show ourselves approval, Father God. We thank you for the leadership, uh, Brother Watkins and Brother Benny and the elders for having the vision to put forth this training on to really help us really understand what your word is, that when we read your word, it's you talking to us. And Father, we pray that as we pray, we talk back to you that we have effective communication, oh, Father God. We just ask that you'll be with every member here that will continue to hunger and thirst after this righteousness, oh, Father God, that we may continue to give you more in 2024. We ask that you'll continue to be with those who are uh, driving to get to their destinations. Bless those who couldn't make it on tonight, oh, Father God, that we pray that you'll give them the opportunity to join us on tomorrow night. We just thank you so much for all things that you're doing in the vineyard here at Simpson Street and that you'll continue to bless us forevermore. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for him being the ultimate sacrifice. And thank you for the privilege and power of prayer through his name. We pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a good night. All right. Amen. Tomorrow. Good night, everyone.